Thank you, Carol. It's an honor for me to introduce our next speaker, Jim Wadley. Jim is the airport manager for both the Reading Municipal Airport, which was re recently renamed to Reading Regional Airport and Benton Airport. Today, Jim will be discussing the benefits of engaging your airport management team for aviation and airport safety, along with some sharing some of his superior grant processes, procedures, and insights. As a pilot with my 182 hangar at Reading Regional Airport, I got to know Jim shortly after it was announced that he was the new city of Reading's airport manager by simply making a call to his office and asking for 30 minutes of his time to introduce myself. Jim has quite an extensive background in aviation like, Ken, like Carol had mentioned, starting with Continental Airlines as a ramp agent, a Marine Corps radar air traffic controller for five years, an airport construction project manager, airport ops manager, interim airports manager for the city of Palo Alto, San Mateo and Half Moon Bay. Please ask your questions via Zoom icon um, and Jim, encourage you, Jim encourages you to ask your questions as they come up during the presentation. Don't forget door prizes. We'll be drawing for a precise flight pulse oximeter and a Go My Go Flight custom embroidered Pro Pilot flight bag. If you're not yet a member of Cal Pilots, please check the chat for the Cal Pilots link. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Wadley. Can't hear you, Jim. Jim, you're on mute. You know, he's, his microphone's turned off. Uh-oh. That's not a good look. I just, I just sent him a message. Okay, let's do a sound check. Yep, yes. I got you now. Uh, very good. Looks like there was two choices on my microphone. I uh, didn't know that. My apologies. So people of the sky, good morning. I'm Jim Wadley. I am the airports manager for the city of Reading. Uh, I manage a 139 airport and a charming GA airport. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to briefly talk about before I begin is, uh, you know, membership into Cal Pilots. Um, you know, it's it's my personal belief that this kind of membership is is very important and it's important to keep it current and stay active. Um, what's so important about this is that these kind of organizations will help share a lot of information and oftentimes, you know, there can be a unified approach to something and, you know, even sharing case studies where successes have happened. Uh, these kinds of things are deserving to share and I uh, just definitely want to encourage membership into Cal Pilots and, and also to keep currency. Um, so now I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to try my little handy dandy clicker here. Um, so here's a quick flight plan for this session. Um, what I, you know, what does engaging airport management look like? Uh, we'll go over this from an airport manager's perspective. Uh, then a little understanding of your uh, airport manager's challenges. I think that this kind of perspective is is uh, really important so that, um, you know, sometimes airport managers move slow, but there's reasons for it oftentimes. Uh, but, you know, even how to support your airport manager, which I think is uh, also important in ways that uh, the pilots can do better than uh, the airport itself. Uh, and then also, what does a roadmap to safety look like? So here we go. I recommend you do buckle up because I can sometimes fly a little fast. I will have plenty of time for questions. So hit me with those uh, during the session or after the, uh, the session if you want. Um, I will answer them all the best I can. And I will definitely share my perspective if you have a situation. Um, so what does engaging airport management look like and how can you affect some, some change to enhance safety? Um, you know, I think engaging airport management, it starts with understanding of the challenges. There's more um, sometimes than what's revealed. There's, there's internal pressures, there's a, a sequence to things, there's a, there's a lot of different requirements. Every, every munis municipality, whether a city or a county, you know, can, can do things a little bit different. Um, some airports have more money than others, uh, better, you know, more organized uh, budgets, but there, there could be other barriers or, you know, like I said, just a, a simply a, a sequence to things that is, is time consuming. Um, after you have established a relationship, um, you know, it basically it's just a conversation. That's really all it is. It's really informal. It doesn't need to be formal. Um, I've been part of formal um, engagements. I've been part of informal and, you know, either one is fine, but it doesn't need to be a very formal uh, conversation. I can tell you that each side can learn a little bit from the other. 
Um, my background is an air traffic controller. I am not a pilot, um, but I was, uh, some of my passion started being under the approach corridor for Houston Intercontinental Airport. Um, like Carol, I got an air show every day. Um, so I just, uh, I have a passion for aviation and yet I don't know at all. And I certainly don't get the, uh, the pilot in the sky perspective. So, um, and then also we can, the airport managers can certainly share a little bit about um, some of their challenges and, and what they're facing. But um, in order to affect any sort of change, there are various mechanisms. You really need to remain active. The, what's important for uh, this is, you know, I don't want pilots from my perspective to, to let things get to a frustrating point. It is very important that you just kind of let us know, hey, the gate is sticking, people are, are tailgating, um, there's wildlife, there's striping issues, there's fog, you know, there, there could be, it could be anything. And, you know, we may be focused on something and have our blinders on, but, you know, it's important that these messages get passed because we don't see it all. Um, and we, uh, we also, you know, like I said, we don't, we don't see all the conditions and, and we certainly don't see them deteriorate as you guys are flying, um, you know, daily, weekly, or monthly. Um, at towered airports, you know, there's a lot of promotion of safety through local runway safety action team meetings uh, each year. And whether you have an LSAR, LRSAT, um, you know, group or not, deficiencies need to be identified. And, and oftentimes the, the path requires major capital projects, just depending on what it is. Um, FA grants require um, projects to be eligible. So there's a lot of different particulars um, with that. And it's, it's, really, it's really tough to kind of get um, up to speed. But once you, once you start um, networking with other airports and you, you go to conferences and you actually, um, I'll talk about it a little bit later, you know, hire some consultants, you know, you can really get some things done and in how to use your money, the, the limited resources a little bit more wiser um, but when you do have FA projects, for example, there is a required sequence to things. And a lot of times these conditions, um, pilots are looking for an answer now and they're looking for something quick, but depending on how um, serious the issue is or how, how big it is, um, it, they may not be able to, uh, the airports may not be able to get to it right away. There, there will be a sequence to the ultimate objective, which will be a construction of something uh, to fix it. Um, so, you know, do you want to chase after grants or not? It's, it's really, uh, it's a, it's a question I think every airport manager should be, um, asking themselves and really the answer should be yes, in my opinion. Um, so what does it feel like to be an airport manager? I think, uh, you know, I wanted to share this because this is from my perspective and, you know, this is, uh, this is kind of what it feels like. Yeah, it's, uh. You know, every airport manager, I don't know if there's any others on here, but, you know, they'll feel like it too. There is a, a lot of tugs and pulls from various different directions. You, you could have, you know, personnel needs, personnel issues, budgets, internal pressures, external pressures, regulations, deadlines of various kinds. Um, but it really takes somebody to be service oriented. And, you know, I really hope that, um, you know, airports do have somebody that is willing to, you know, roll up their sleeves and get things done for people. Um, so what can you do for your airport in aviation? Um, if you haven't already meet with your airport manager, you know, we are good people and, uh, we, we, we should be discussing issues and deficiencies and, you know, and I hope that you can also ask, uh, the question, how can you help? Because there are times that you can help with things. Um, I even recommend meeting with his or her boss, you know, the airport manager's boss. You know, it's important to make sure that they know, hey, uh, this is important to us, you know, um, what can we do about this? And, and, you know, and you'd be surprised how much attention that can get sometimes to affect something um, that may be a, a situation where things have remained so long and, you know, it, it's, it, it, something's got to, something's got to change. Um, sometimes it's not the airport. Sometimes it's uh, a little bit higher up or, or within the organization. A lot of airports are underneath the Department of Public Works, and you'll get a Department of Public Works flavor, in my opinion, uh, doing that. Um, so, you know, there are different things that you can do. 
Um, I always tell my boss that I also have about 500 or 1,000 different bosses, and that's the tenants, that's the stakeholders. And, you know, it's a really important perspective for me because it's uh, it's not my airport. And and I would say that to my boss, and, and I would get funny looks because, you know, it is your airport, and I'm like, no, it's not. This is the tenants, this is the community's airport. Um, but, uh, the, you know, there's other things you can do to help strate- strategize and prioritize these issues. Um, you know, at, at uh, San Carlos, we had a facilities top 10 and I got to see what was important to the pilots and instead of from an airport manager's perspective. So that was a, a, a really big takeaway for me. It was, uh, a, I got to see what the pilots value and, you know, sometimes I was a little off base and, you know, we can re, re, uh, uh prioritize some of our things. Now, um, airports may also have to follow uh, a prioritization, um, for the, for the FAA. So every project will have a, a, a national priority ranking. And, you know, you start at runway center line and you go away. So as you get further away, the priority starts dropping. And I had a situation once where we were trying to get some uh, taxi lanes between hangars uh, reconstructed. And, uh, you know, the FAA had said, you know, look, you have a, uh, your condition on the runway actually needs to be addressed before we can get out there. Now, the this was this was a little bit tough for the the tenants because they've been waiting for so long to get these conditions improved but there is a prioritization ranking and sometimes the faa will move the goalpost on the airport and uh it's but we will try everything we can we've there is sometimes a a technique and a negotiation you can have with the faa um, about what's important and they, they do listen um, and they will try to help you get grants. But getting getting uh, in the queue for things is uh, is really important. And you know something I'm going to talk about is you know these these grants if you pursue them they're it's definitely a marathon not a sprint. Um, but uh, let me get back on on task here. The the airport manager and pilots should be networking with other airports. I think that this kind of organization, like I mentioned, you can share some of these case studies and, and, you know, what's affecting us could be affecting you next. And, and it's really, it's really important to get up to speed and, and sometimes you can get ahead of things. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there's other things out there like attending conferences. Um, you know, the FAA conference is free. Uh, that one is a, is very valuable. It, it talks about, you know, new deadlines and, and how the, the, uh, priorities are going to be established for the FAA and, you know, what are the congressional initiatives now and, and things like that. So understanding those and aligning those to your airport can actually benefit you in a lot of different ways. Um, so, so some of the common challenges, you know, airport managers will sometimes see a lot of deferred maintenance and it's, you can't just go in and solve it. You know, you need to have some money. Uh, there could be some staffing limitations, uh, obviously budget limitations. Now there's, some pretty slow internal processes there really are um, and oftentimes you know a, uh, a, a city or a, a county is a little bit misguided on how to operate an airport um, i try to you know emphasize that airports you know, you know are federally obligated they are not parks and we need to run an airport like an airport uh, there are expectations and and uh, you know as an airport manager i'm also a risk manager and I definitely don't want to see um, the airport slapped, you know, with something that could have been avoided. Um, but airports are also getting, um, you know, everything around airports, you know, mainly 139 airports, but um, airports in general, things are getting increasingly complex. And as it is, a, you know, from my perspective, um, not being a pilot, I know that it's, it's also getting tougher and tougher being a pilot. Things are very expensive, fuels expensive, insurance, uh, taxes. You know, and so one of the things that I'm trying to do, and I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to do the textbook maneuver, which is, you know, jack up rates to pay for things. I'm actually trying to diversify revenue streams. And I really think that it's important that you engage your airport to help diversify revenue streams. Um, we, we, we did a, a couple of different studies and, you know, in Reading here. And for Reading, Reading Regional Airport specifically, we wanted to know, okay, what was the economic um, impact, and what is what does it look like if this airport vanishes? And we we discovered that is about two hundred and eighteen million dollars a year out of the local economy and state because of this airport 
um, it would vanish with it. And that was an eye opener for our council and for our city management. And, and they really saw how big of an economic engine this airport is. But the same also applies for GA airports where GA, uh, just aviation in general can really come through in style for you know, things like disasters and VIP movement and things. Um, there's, there's a lot of different economics. And I think, you know, diversifying revenue streams um, so that you can, the airport can stay solvent during uh, times when, uh, you know, there's a recession and things. And you want to be able to, you know, seek non-aeronautical revenue um, so that you can, in a way, subsidize aviation. You're, you're, the airports are legally allowed to do that and, and keep an aviation, a very, um, you know, fair aviation rate. And, and that's something that I've been trying to do, and it seems to be working here in Reading. But I think every airport manager should be considering things that, okay, if we need to affect change, we can't get a grant this year, but we got to get some things done, you know, how are we going to pay for it? You know, we need to reach out and do some different things. Um, so how can you make your airport safer? Well, I think airports should be pursuing grants, 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 and more grants. Um, seeking FAA uh, Airport Improvement Program grant assistance can be tedious. Um, it's not hard once you understand the sequence and what makes a project eligible. Um, each project does have to meet FA standards in order to be eligible. Um, and these, these kinds of things are, um, airport managers don't know all the design standards. We don't, we, we, we're familiar, but um, really it's aviation consultants that do this. And this is something that, you know, if, if, if you're SFO, you'll have Planner, planners in-house, you'll have designers, you know, engineers in-house. But if you're an airport uh, like Reading or a lot of GA airports, you are not going to have the staff to be able to do this stuff in-house. So what do you need to do? You need to reach out to, to consultants. Now there's a process to do that, FA process, to make all that eligible because you want their task orders, their scope and fees to be eligible for grant assistance. And that's kind of the secret is, you know, you can utilize and tap the, the consultants to help you affect some of these safety improvements on your airport and you put it in the grant application and you will get a grant and um, and I'll, I'll go over some of the, uh, the particulars of the grants in a second. Um, but again, what does it uh, pursuing grants look like? You know, every FAA project has a deadline. Um, these deadlines will change every year. Um, these things are passed along through conferences and and um, and other, you know, communications. But, you know, usually when you touch something um, on the airport, um, let's say the design standard has changed, you actually need to update the, that condition to the new standard. Um, a situation I have here is I have to, uh, our runway safety area is too flat. We actually need to, at the edges of our runway safety area, cut two feet two feet times 7,000 feet long, that's a lot of material. So that's not a cheap project. But um, when, a, when a safety deficiency is known, the FAA will require you to finish that project in order to get to move on to other projects. So um, you just got to understand that when you touch something, it's not sometimes as simple as uh, maybe striping the runway um, with the new you know, rum, um, numerals. So you have a magnetic variation. You may actually have to do um, some electrical and move the design, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the guidance signs out and, and other striping. So sometimes things will touch and you have to kind of chase it. But it's important to understand that that can happen. Um, all right, so some important considerations. Uh, maintenance. Maintenance is 100% on the airport. Um, it is not, the FAA does not do maintenance. And, you know, they will do rehabilitation projects and reconstructions and even preservation projects. So the, the, uh, the in order to offset your maintenance, uh, in my opinion, you should be, an airport should be pursuing uh, preservation projects. So for example, every five years, you go out and you uh, do a micro seal or slurry seal on a parking apron. And that will put that wearing pad back and preserving that that condition, condition, you will get crack sealing, you'll get the striping. Um, the striping, just to give you an example, um, our our main our primary runway at RDD is uh, it, it'll be about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars just to restripe uh, one coat on the runway. Um, so how do you how do you uh, 
you know, avoid that. Well, you can every five years do a preservation project and you get your striping, you get your preservation, you get your crack sealing, you keep the conditions good. Otherwise, these conditions will deteriorate um, and you could be chasing that at 100 percent your cost. So, you know, it's 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 really important to be proactive with these grants and doing regular um, assessments of your areas. The, the FAA actually requires you to do what's called an airport pavement management system and you will have to assess every area of your field and it will prioritize it for you. Um, now at, at RDD, for example, you know, what you see there for the picture, um, we spent about $20,000 of our um, of airport money just on the materials just to crack seal. And we, we, we hit some areas that were basically the paving joints on center line and then one on either side of it. And it really didn't even cover the entire runway. And it also didn't include the labor costs from the public work streets crews. Um, so, you know, doing preservation projects uh, to get the crack sealing, to get the slurry and the restriping and the, those enhancements. And uh, it's just really important to do those in the intervals that you can do them. Um, you can't do them any sooner than five years, but if you can stay on it, it's, um, it's really an important strategy. And, you know, I, I'll talk a little bit later about um, some more of that and how you can, um, you know, help your own enterprise fund. But uh, some of the grants that are available, the airport, in, in, excuse me, the airport improvement program is generally 90% funded. And, and if you're a GA airport you, in the state of California, you can get a Caltrans Division of Aeronautics match of 5% of the federal share. And that just really makes your airport enterprise fund match um, matching funds all that much less. Now, there's times there's 100% um, funding out there, uh, supplemental, and um, at RDD, I've been able to do a, a $5 million access road project, and that was all 100% funded. And uh, and so, you know, those, we had some strategies to be able to get that because we had some other looming higher priority projects, but that's where you work with the FA and you can get some of these other lower priority projects funded, but we were able to benefit from 100% grants and uh, that's pretty significant. Um, and then there's also, you know, an underutilized program out there for um, airport, you know, GA airports, $10,000. You could, you know, we use it for service vehicles. We use it for radios. We use it for so many different things. So instead of keeping, you know, your conditions the way they are, if you reach out and you try to get these grants, you can actually affect some change in, in, in those, those different ways. But, and there's many other things you can do. Um, I mean, there's even a chance to get earmarked funds um, depending on your condition. Um, so what does a roadmap to safety look like? Well, there's something called the Airport Capital Improvement Plan. It's, uh, it's submitted every year and it goes, you know, current to five years out. And, uh, you know, these projects have to be listed in your airport pavement management system because you need to have a um, pavement condition number to on the on the grant application and also on your ASIP, they, the FAA wants to see that now. And it starts to get pretty tedious with all these requirements. And I'm saying this because I want you to understand from um, an airport's perspective that there are a lot of things required in order to affect some of these safety projects. Um, and so having that those values out there, you know, you, you, we can't do it in house. So we have to have consultants. And and again, we that's all eligible. Um, but then you have something called the Section 163, you know, basically, does the FA have jurisdiction? And, and um, a lot of times there's uh, also things like a cultural study needed. Uh, 7460 is just a, an air, airspace study. Um, doing a magnetic variation, um, believe it or not, needed an airspace study, our pavement preservation project. And, uh, but what's important about that, pro that process is it actually has multiple lines of business and, and they review a number of things. But um, 7460 process is something that usually can go concurrent with some others, but a lot of these generally are, are uh, there's prerequisites for each. Um, but you have to maintain an updated airport layout plan. Um, you know, there are changes from time to time that you can do informally, and it's called a pen and ink. Those are supposed to be limited, but um, you can do something in order to, to keep uh, forward progress. Um, but you got to keep these updated every year. And, and as you, um, you know, about every five or 10 years, you, you do an airport layout plan update narratives to, uh, report 
or maybe even a master plan. But that's basically your planning document. It's kind of the Bible of what we need to uh, to follow uh, on airports. Um, and then also, does the airport or so the, do, do each of these projects have the National Environmental Protection Agency clearance, the environmental clearances? Um, and sometimes what can be brought up is, you know, how's your wildlife is, uh, plans? Is, are they current? Have you done any assessments and updates? Um, some airports, you know, have a big um, goose problem, you know, Canada goose or um, uh, seagulls or, or coyotes where we're at and deer. Um, so there's mitigation to those as well. Airports are allowed to, to do various things to help with that. And, and sometimes these projects are eligible for FA funds. Um, and then for every project, there's also required a construction safety and phasing plan. Um, these are pretty comprehensive. You know, we got to maintain runway safety and uh, but any, these are required. And then, you know, the last thing here I, I put, it's kind of an under uh, appreciated thing, it, the disadvantaged business enterprise program. Um, this can hold up grants now. I see it in applications uh, where the, uh, the, the DBE liaison with the FAA will um, actually have to sign off. And if, you're, if your DB program is not up to date, this is where you have goals on, um, you, then this can hold up your grant project. So it's, there's a lot of different programs involved with these things. And it's, it's really, you know, somebody coming in new, it's gonna be really hard to kind of absorb this, but you're, you don't need to do it alone. Airport managers have a really strong network within themselves and, and they help each other out. I, I actually get phone calls all year long. And I'm very happy to help out um, other airports. So if your airport is uh, doesn't really know some of the ins and outs and particulars of, of grants, they can reach out to me and I'll help them. I'll tell them exactly how I do it. And uh, you know, I have right now 20 open grants, and um, and they're not very old either. Um, and so they're, you know, you want to close out grants as quickly as possible just so you can keep getting more. But uh, you know, it's airport managers are never done with uh with what they're doing they just you know over time they just start over and they just do the preservation and and they just keep going so um you know i just really can't underscore grants uh, enough this is my mechanism to enhance safety and um you know otherwise it's 100 percent on the airport enterprise fund and i really think that um you know the pilots they their funds um they need to go to other uses and and you know not having to, to 100% fund a project when we can get assistance. Um, so what are some common safety issues? Well, FOD, it could be FOD because of, um, you know, it could be even a helicopter coming in and landing and there's just uh, you know, a very narrow area for a heavy uh, helicopter and it just, it could FOD, FOD things out. You could do projects to help with that and, and create apron space so that, um, you can you can have those um, appropriate sized aircraft land where they need to be, um, but it could be fought because of you know your your pavement conditions are unraveling, and um, you know the, a lot of times you'll see striping that's faded or obscured by tire marks, um, you know ponding on the runway that's not a good situation, um, wildlife issues undulations in the pavement you know if you're in Bay Area and you have uh, Bay mud this kind of condition will happen. Um, trees and other obstructions, uh, lighting issues, you know, where I'm at right now in, RIT, in RDD, the, uh, the runway lighting, it'll, it'll be bright, dim, bright, dim. It's just, uh, it's on its last leg and we're, we're working on that right now to do an electrical assessment. And meanwhile, with all the sustainability push, we're, we're going to be doing a, a, a environmental stewardship kind of a study as well. And these studies, they're, they're all grant eligible. And so um, how can you get um, a new lighting system? I mean, ours has passed its useful life. Um, do we go to LED? You know, what can we do? And that will help with our operating costs as well. How can you put a system on it that will that'll tell you the health of the system so you can see where things are starting to fail before they do? Um, <clears throat> but there's, there's, many, there's many things, but if you don't know what to do, oftentimes there's a study for it and that'll reveal your path. Um, it'll, it'll tell the FA um, the various paths and what the recommended one is, why, um, you know, is it practicable and, and things like that. Um, so here's a, a case study I wanted to kind of share. So we had, uh, at RDD, we also have a fire tank base that's attached to us. Um, 
and they're 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 heavy aircraft. They're 737s, MD-87s, C-130s, um, S-2, Bok jets. There's, there's so many different aircraft that utilize this airport. And they, they, when we, when it's fire season, we go hot and heavy. And we had a condition here. This happens to be, it's really difficult to see, uh, but this is actually at a paving joint. And we have uh, a condition where it's, it's called curling, where moisture has gotten in. And this, this joint was actually a cold joint when it was constructed. The new spec these days is if you have a cold joint, you have to saw cut it, tack coat, and pave next to it. And that'll prevent conditions like this. Um, but we have this condition and it's causing this curling and it's cracking and it's kind of even alligatoring. So it's lifting up and this can cause an unplanned closure. Um, this can have impacts on air service. This can have impacts on air medical flight training, you know, just any, any use. Um, and so this, this was a temporary patch. We have a couple of years ago, we had three unplanned closures, you know, and that's when we spent a lot of money on, um, on crack ceiling. In fact, we use grants to, um, help us with our, our budget. Um, we use L grants to pay down debt service, the debt service that we were going to use uh, for that fiscal year, we were able to convert that debt service budget to reserves. Reserves then bought a crack seal um, equipment. So the debt service was eligible under these grants. And uh, that that's, it's, it, it was intended to keep airports solvent during, you know, the impacts of COVID. So we did a little bit of, you know, switching around the, the budget to be able to affect these things, but you can get your own crack sealer um, and not be at the mercy of public work streets crews anymore because they have oftentimes a city with these conditions and they don't, they don't wanna come to the airport when they have their own problems. So um, we were able to do some various things, but you know, we have, we, you know, you could see cracking like this. This is an example where, you know, you, you, you need to crack seal. The conditions can continue to get worse and they're really important to kind of stay ahead of. What you see here is shadows. Believe it or not, it's, it's hard, to, it's not really that hard, but what you see is shadows. And if you can imagine, this could cause a loss of control. Um, so what do you do? Well, if you don't know how bad it is, just do a study. So what we did, um, well, I'll get into what we did, but you know, oftentimes these studies are eligible and it's my personal policy not to throw good money after bad. Um, if we try to stay away from a reconstruct just to avoid the high costs and the high impacts and choose to do a re rehabilitation, which is just a mill and fill of the top layer, it, it may not solve the problem and it can rear its ugly head within a year or so. And you, the airport is responsible again, 100% of the costs, and you're right back to where you were. Um, so you're really not putting money where it's good. Um, you know, it, you're just creating more impacts and moving the problem. Um, so you know, this could be years. So let's say, let's say this is this required a reconstruct, and we end up doing a rehab. Um, it needs to be years before you come back and do another rehab. You can't say to the FAA, hey, we picked the wrong problem or wrong project. We need to do a, a, a reconstruct next year. The FAA is going to say, no, you, it has to be like preservation projects generally is about five years or more and reconstructs. That's every 20 years. These pay, the, the pavement needs to be 20 years, like rehab and reconstructs. Um, so it's really important that you, you pick the right project and you put good money um, where it belongs. Um, so we have at RDD various conditions. And what did we do? We did a preliminary design concept study. And this cost about $450,000. And uh, this one was actually 100% funded. Uh, we asked for it. We pursued it. And we needed to know how bad it was. And we had you know, various, various conditions. And this was something quite honestly, that would kind of keep me up at night. I would, it would worry me about, you know, when heavy aircraft would, would uh, land on the runway and the, the impacts it would cause, because we also launch um, air, air service. So we definitely didn't want to jeopardize our air service, but we we did enough um, uh, things here that we are now programmed for a grant in 2024. That's actually a pretty major project. 
um, we are we are doing a, uh, a, a rehabilitation. So this is what it's going to look like. Um, so the the study revealed that it was not full section; it was just the top lift. So we are going to be milling out four inches, and our runway was actually too flat. And we got to meet the des design standard. So we're going to be putting a leveling course to crown the runway just slightly, just enough, and then do a, uh, a four inch overlay. So that was the solution for us. We got lucky that, uh, you know, we, we did a bunch of borings and we uh, geotech and non-destructive um, uh, testing. And, and so that was our path. And we're looking at this project in 2024. We're doing a design right now. We're 60% through that design. That's a $1.2 million design, I believe. And our um, this project, we're looking at $16 million. And obviously, we need a grant for that. So we're going to be matching. Um, we're going to be matching 10%. And if, as a 139 airport, this is another thing that it's a little tip and trick. Um, you know, you can utilize passenger facility charges to help you reimburse, help reimburse the airport um, of that uh, local match. And, and this is the thing that I've learned is if you even, if you have to go out and get a low interest state loan or something internally with the city, if you put the interest in the application, now the interest is eligible. So for a 139 airport, it's 100, this project's 100% funded, just a matter of time. So you can amortize these projects. And uh, in, in that way, you're not hurting uh, the users in such a way. So diversifying revenue streams. And you know what I'm trying to do is actually, to the maximum extent I can, freeze rates. I'm trying to draw in aviation, keep aviation cheap. It's expensive enough and go after other sources and tap the grants to the maximum extent possible. And when you, not only are your consultants eligible, but you can even put your own personnel that are working on these projects to administer the consultants and everything, that time is eligible for the grant too. So let's say you have a budget of personnel, say it's a clean million dollars, and you have, um, let's say you have three projects and you have $10,000 each. Now you're offsetting that with, uh, you know, grants and you're, you're freeing up your personnel so that, that that personnel budget, the budget dollars for the personnel now get to basically convert to reserves that you'll have savings at the end of the year on your, uh, on your expenses. So, you know, you, in a way it's, it's healthy for your budget to be doing projects to improve your conditions um, and, and help your budget out to lift these heavy loads. And so you can offset these things in, in just different ways. So um, again, this project we're gonna be doing in 2024, um, I wanna do it sooner, but we can't just because of uh, various things, but you know, we're, um, we've got a plan to, to maintain and, and inspect uh, on a regular basis. And we're actually, the runway's holding up uh, gloriously right now. Uh, the stuff we put down was meant for high temperature swings, cold, which we, we get snow here all the way to triple digits. And so if anybody has these kind of conditions, I'd be happy to share the spec uh, of the product that we use that um, uh, worked out really well for us. Okay, so these projects, um, you know, again, with safety in mind, trying to fix something, these, these are oftentimes a marathon, it's not a sprint. So rarely do you get a chance to sprint, um, but if you know what to do, you might as well start the clock. That's kind of my, my take on it. Don't defer, don't miss these grant cycles. Um, these, these things do take time and uh, the result really is worth it because you know sometimes the journey is very difficult and it's very taxing. But what I personally love and I kind of caught the bug is you know being able to look over my shoulder and say, you know that was an awesome project and it was worth it. Um, and that's something that we are doing for the users. And, um, but, you know, there's, so that the resources needed, um, you know, having staff that are, that are that at least knowledgeable that there are grants out there and can utilize consultants to help them out. Um, these consultants know what to do. Um, they can help and it can be eligible. There's other things that are not eligible, but still it's cheaper to have a task order for a consultant to do it than to hire another body that will have a long-term debt like retirement that the city or the airport will have to pay for. And usually personnel, adding personnel is kind of a 
it's a it's a dirty word people don't want to talk about in the city and you know it, it's hard to remind them that we're enterprise funds and we and you may be able to afford it and so there's still some tugs and pulls internally um but you just got to advocate and that's all i do is i will advocate internally i'll advocate with the fa externally it doesn't matter um it just it just it it's just a conversation. That's really how I look look at it. Um, but again, these costs, uh, the, it, there's a there's a way to do it, and uh, and it's just utilizing resources, especially when you have uh, very few. So I will uh, turn this over for questions. Um, I they could be anything. They can be anything from you know how do you do this, how do you do that, to how did um, you know what can we do to increase improve. A certain safety project, and I'll, I'll tell you my perspective and the path that I would take. Thank you, Jim. I, I do have a couple of questions, or about three of them that popped up here, and uh, as they come in, I will uh, relay them to you. So we had uh, one of the members of, of the participants say, if someone wants to consider a career change to managing a smaller airport, what background and experience is necessary? Well, um, how I started, you know, I, I did Marine Corps service, air traffic, and I started off uh, in airport operations. And it was a part time, non benefited uh, position, no guarantee of hours. And uh, at that time, honestly, I was wondering if I was going to go back in the Marine Corps. Uh, but I fell in love with aviation, I fell in love with airports and, and, um, and operations. And I think uh, there could be different paths. I've seen many different paths, actually. Um, even some of my best hires have been zero airport experience. And I don't want airport management degrees and air, airport experience to discourage anybody from, from applying if they don't have it. Um, having, um, you know, you have an interest in the airport, and I think that that's enough. And there are resources out there where you can develop yourself. And I do see that, um, like, let's say there's an airport under Department of Public Works. Well, that public works director doesn't really understand everything there is to know about airports. And, you know, they'll, they'll definitely, uh, you know, pick a pilot just because of they, they don't understand that uh, there's other particulars out there. But there, everybody has different strengths. I've, saw, I've seen people come in as a welder and end up taking over something. And, um, you know, as a pilot, you know, I'm just going you know, to assume that there's a, a pilot um, that's probably asking that. I think, you know, you understand more than anybody what services the airport need to provide and how you can better those. And, and then just identifying, okay, here is the deficiency and then identifying the path and what resources to use. And in those, that, that path can be um, determined not by your own city, but really through other airports and, and just learning uh, through conferences. So I think starting another career, I would encourage it. I can tell you, it's not an easy path you know, from that slide I showed you, there's a lot of tugs and pulls. There's a lot of competing needs and it's tough because you have staff you have to take care of and keep, you have to train them. Um, and, you know, I, I go by the two leadership principles of the Marine Corps, which is mission accomplishment and true welfare. So when we're not working on something mission critical, I'm focusing on staff. And that has led me to a lot of successes because I have very loyal staff that are behind me and they're working really hard. So being a really good leader, I think is more important than anything. And, um, but, you know, engaging, engaging other airports would be one way to do it. And there are certifications you can do um, and in getting in the, the American Association of Airport Executives, AAAE, and becoming a member first, and then looking at some of those certification processes, because they will help put your resume on a different stack. And that's what I look at at a glance. Do they have certifications? Do they have experience? And so you start there generally, because you want somebody that can um, jump right in. Now, if there isn't somebody, but there, there, there's, there could be a strength somewhere else, um, you know, all I'm just trying to say is the certifications will help. And I would start with the AAAE of organization that's specifically for airport managers. And, um, and it's, it's a very powerful uh, organization. Great. Thanks. I do have um, a few comments from uh, David G. He says, in general, what frustrates me the most is when airport managers trade airport land away to fund operation costs. And I, and I did talk to him about RENA and the, the 
Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, I would like to see the FAA step in to prohibit airports from giving away aeronautical use land for non-aeronautical use like they used to be able to do. However, I've heard that the FAA has been stripped of some of their power to do that. Ideally, airports would strategically buy up additional land around the airport so the trend is opposite. For example, if there's an unhappy neighbor, it would be nice to be able to help them move somewhere else and replace them with an airport-friendly neighbor. Maybe cow pilots could make an effort to, to, to society, wealthy aircraft owners to donate or to solicit wealthy aircraft owners to donate to a real estate purchase fund to strategically buy land adjoining airports that would enhance the airport. And, and I'll, I'll let you, and then there's a couple other little uh, follow-up comments he made, but I'll let you answer, uh, yeah. uh, address this. That, that's the thing that frustrates me as well, because real estate's real estate. And not only do you need to have some, some uh, I mean, look at the California land use law of, of being able to have open areas around airports to, you know, for aircraft crashes. Um, there is a safety element and you have everywhere typical airport encroachment. And, you know, as airports grow, I mean, the, the where I'm at right now, we're, we're the seventh fastest growing airport in the nation of our size. And I wish I had more real estate. And there are internal pressures. And then if you know you're going to get outranked to 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 sell something, um, but it's my job to advocate not to to keep it at least to long term lease it so you still control the use, but also can make some long term revenue rather than one time money that gets spent, because you're really not solving a lot of problems when you have a lot of one time money. If you want to have more staff or do more projects, you have to have a solid 10 year plan with long term revenue. And the best way to do that is to utilize your own property in long term um, leasing. Um, so, yeah, get, getting rid of airport property, I think, is a mistake. And I think every airport should be, uh, you know, maybe looking at those uses and allowing um, depending on if it's contiguous or not with the main parcel, you could utilize a non-aeronautical thing. For example, I have on the other side of the road, airport road, two five acre parcels, and I really want to develop one of them for um, a hotel, a hotel that will complement our air service airport. So that's a good example of a non-aeronautical thing that I would definitely support. Now you don't want to give up prime real estate for non-aeronautical. So um I'll give you another example. And, and RDD, we have a parking problem. Our air service has boomed so much so that we're overflowing into the fields. And the easiest thing to do is go build another parking lot um, somewhere, but that that's our prime real estate for aviation. And so maybe it's better on a long-term plan to do a parking structure and do a customer facility charge on the car rentals that has a return and, and, uh, and so there's a lot of different ways you can do things, but yeah, the easiest path sometimes is to sell it. And I'm not in favor of that. Um, now, what were some of the follow-up questions? Okay, uh, David G also mentioned, he said, another idea I've had, can we build employee housing on the airports that would be reserved for airport employees and the employees of SASOs? So airport employees could be insured to have access to affordable housing very near where they work. Mm -hmm. And 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 then he then he further stated an even bigger idea was to be lobby the state funding legislation to buy out neighbors who live near inside safety zone one at airports to move them to a better location. Maybe in collaboration with groups like Habitat for Humanity. And he says, yes, I realize this is pretty way out there, but never say never. You can't do it if you don't dream of it. Yeah, and, and you also don't get it if you don't ask. And I, I'm, um, I, I, I do a lot of unconventional things. I do a lot of out of the box things and I take uh, risk sometimes so much so that, you know, my, uh, it concerns my city sometimes, but it, it generally I've been very successful and it's just because I have a, a calculated plan and, but I can't underscore um, relationships enough. So if there is a group out there that you want to partner with, I think having a great relationship and a positive working relationship is really important. It could affect some change. You know, housing on airports is not allowed, uh, period. Now, it this is different though, because I do believe personally, there is an appropriate use of that uh, for those that wanna do it. Now, 
that's not up to me. That's up to FA compliance. It's already hard enough to do a crew quarters for like an air medical. Um, but, uh, that is definitely something that it can be pursued individually with the FA and it, and, and it could end up going to DC. Um, but I do think that there's some, some value there because, you know, pilots need rest, right. And maybe there's, you know, things airports can do to help with those kind of limitations. And now I think it's even extending in California, at least to uh, the, the rest of the crew of, of, uh, of air carrier airplanes. And so, you know, I do think that maybe down the road, there should be consideration for, you know, these kinds of things. I do believe that that would be great, especially somebody that, you know, just like a park ranger on, on, the, on the park, you have, you know, some airport staff or, uh, I think by extension, I think the question said, even for employees that are at the airport, um, I, I can't answer that from a perspective of the FAA. I just know that the on, um, you know, living on the airport has a lot of different particulars. And, uh, but I don't see why that can't be something pursued and it could affect some change down the road. But I think that the group, um, Cal pilots, um, could bring that up and, um, you know, and I think some airports would be in favor of it. I'm, I'm not opposed to it. Great. And uh, David G just responded, building hotels near airports is a great idea, especially it can be access or access from a transient ramp easily. And then there was one more question that I'll make really quick. And let me bring that up here. And that was from Santosh K. He says, how to get weight bearing analysis for runways and taxiways is the question. He says, when I was the military air ops coordinator for wings over Fullerton Airport Day at Fullerton Municipal Airport, we were offered the Lockheed Martin F-35B Lightning II STVOL short takeoff vertical landing variant of the JSF Joint Strike Fighter for the Marine Corps from the VMA, VMFA 122 Crusaders, which was a common, which was a concern they might sink into the runway and taxiway if not, if not melted if not the asphalt melts. So I. Yeah. And I've, I've seen this many times. Um, you, especially in places like uh, Reading where it's really hot. I mean, even over at in Half Moon Bay, I wasn't there, but um, that was mentioned earlier in, in the session, um, the previous session, there was an F-18, the nose gear right through the ramp. And uh, yeah, the way around that I've done it at, uh, Half Moon Bay and particularly San Carlos and even Palo Alto is you use trench plates if you know you're going to have aircraft that are uh, going to exceed the, uh, the the weight bearing. Um, and from a runway perspective, you know, we know there's a lot of crazy calculations that are a little bit more powerful than what I can do, but there are ways to figure out how long your pavement's going to last based on the the number of operations and the weight of that aircraft, because you may be designed for a certain weight, but you can handle only so many operations of a higher weight. Uh, but parking, parking aircraft's different. Um, I'm looking at doing, uh, instead of asphalt, which is definitely cheaper, I'm looking at doing concrete because these fire attack aircraft that are here, the influx that we get, we actually are putting them all over the airport. Um, because if those, are, those resources are needed here, I keep them here. So I'll shut down some of the, uh, the less um, uh, traffic, the lower traffic uh, movement areas to accommodate parking. And there's always a concern, depending on the aircraft, what, uh, what the weight is. And we do have to look it up. And we do have a guide on our airport on what, uh, what those capacities are. And they even are shared with military, because a lot of what you mentioned was the military. And um, they have a big giant binder where they know all this stuff. Now that has to be updated from time to time because over time it deteriorates. But um, but yeah, these are these are conditions. Not every airport manager has at their fingertips, but um, especially GA airports, you're not probably going to have some of those studies that are very comprehensive. Uh, but they can be accomplished, and then you can know what your limitations of your pavement are. And some areas are going to you know have more capacity than others. But yeah, that's definitely a consideration that uh, airport managers need to have. Otherwise, you're causing some significant problems. Great, thanks, Jim. And and our timing is quick. Uh, I'll just read a couple comments. Maybe you can uh, answer them on the chat. Um, but we have some drawings to do. So uh, a comment was our trench plates are a question like AM2 expeditionary matting. And then um, 
And then a good uh, David G. Concord, Lompoc, Santa Maria, Van Nuys are, are examples of airports with great hotels. So with that, I'd like to turn this over uh, to, to Jolie to draw the, the prizes. And uh, thank you very much, Jim. That was very uh, informative. informative. Oh, you know, look, we're, one, one more thing here. I'm so sorry. Uh, if here's my contact information, I want to I want to just kind of share real quick that uh, I am accessible if anybody has any questions. So there's my direct line, um, I believe, yeah, my direct line there and my email. Share with the airport manager if you have a, you know, say a brand new airport manager right out of college, you know, do, eyes like this. Um, I'm, I'm here to help. And there's some strategies out there. And th in fact, I, I've got a lot of tricks up my sleeve and I've learned a lot of different things and I want to share what I know. So if, if you have some challenges, you know, hey, Jim, what would you do? I'll give you my perspective. Uh, it's not the only path, but I, I can give you what I would do and, and share my thoughts. And, but um, anyway, I'm accessible if anybody wants to share um, my contact with uh, your airport manager, but do reach out to your airport manager. Um, there's a lot that can be done um, collaboratively. So thank you for having me.